Hey there, I'm Joey from EDHREC, and today I'd like to talk about themes, specifically the ones that are lying to you. I'd like to begin this video with a question. Have you ever built a deck and discovered that it doesn't quite play the way that you thought it would? I don't mean that the deck is just flopping. I mean that the deck is actually performing, but the way that the strategy works, it's, it's pulling in a different direction than what you anticipated from the outset. Or perhaps we can ask that question from the opposite side of the table. Have you ever played against another deck, say a theme deck like Merfolk or Artifacts, but during the game you found yourself surprised that the important parts of those decks barely seemed to be the Merfolks or the Artifacts at all, that a different theme such as Combo or Storm actually emerged as more prominent engines of that game? If you've been playing EDH for any length of time, the answer to those questions is almost certainly yes. I've noticed that odd trend a ton of times over the years, a sort of disconnect between the way that decks appear at first glance versus what they actually do during gameplay. I've noticed it when tweaking my own decks, I've noticed it when helping others tune their decks, I've noticed it in upping the average videos, and I feel it's especially pronounced now with the recent Outlaws of Thunder Junction set and its associated 51 new legendary creatures. Basically, there's this undercurrent of hidden themes in EDH decks, times where it almost feels like a deck is lying to you a little bit, and which causes us to misunderstand what our deck needs and perhaps even accidentally misrepresent what our deck does. So what is that, and why does it happen, and how do we solve it? Well, I think there are two reasons why this happens, one that comes from Wizards of the Coast and one that comes from the player base, but they're each complicated enough that I think they both require their own individual videos to tackle properly, so this video will be about the player's part, and you can keep your eye out for the Wizards one soon enough. If you don't want to miss it, make sure you like and subscribe, hit the bell thingy so that you catch it when it comes out. Y'all are fluent in YouTube, you know the drill. So, the player's part. My hope is that by analyzing some of our behavioral patterns a little more closely, we can get a better sense of how our decks function and what they actually need to succeed. By being more aware of what we're actually asking out of our deck's themes, hopefully we can more quickly figure out which commanders and which cards will actually click best with what it is that we're after. So let's talk about themes, and how they're actually kind of deceptive. Let's examine the possibility that perhaps your deck's sub-theme is its actual theme. For Exhibit A, I'm going to first put forward the Gorion video I did a while back when we got a bunch of new adventure cards. Gorion? Gorion? Gorion. I can never remember this pronunciation. <laughs> uh, way to give away that you haven't played Baldur's Gate 3 yet, Joe. <laughs> Actually, here's something that'll really light the comment section on fire. I've never played a Zelda game either. <laughs> Why am I admitting this to the internet? I grew up on card games, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, in that video, I remarked upon how many of those adventure spells were also removal spells. And since so many of the cards in that deck were adventures with those removal effects, I realized that, hey, this wasn't just an adventure deck, it was a control deck. And for those of you who've watched this video from when I dismantled my Marin deck, you may recall a somewhat similar discussion for that commander too. I became disenamored with Marin because often my optimal play was just to revive the same big removal effects over and over again. I wasn't just playing Reanimator, I was playing Oops All Removal. Frankly, for many commanders that cast things from the yard, removal effects are often so potent and so good at keeping you alive that they fill up tons of slots in those decks. Muldrotha decks are just brimming with things that neutralize enemy cards, because with her ability, they're no longer just one-for-one -one exchanges. Muldrotha easily controls a board because her version of card parity isn't parity at all, and she'll easily outlast opponents this way. I think some Toshiro Umezawa players may be familiar with this too. Each creature that you KO begets more spells, so you're heavily incentivized to play a lot of removal. To give proper context here, in each of their average decks, I counted 21 and 23 cards that have removal type effects, from pinpoint to board wipes to counter spells, whereas other popular commanders in those corresponding colors, like Zaxara or Kyrick, run an average of 12 and 11 removal effects in their respective average decks. Even if you think those latter numbers are too low or what have you, it's certainly observable how much these legends lean on removal as an enormous part of their strategy, even if, in the deck building stage, it might not occur to you just how many of them there are and what effect they'll have on the game. And to this point, when discussing your Muldrotha or your Toshiro deck, how do you describe it? Magic players have a ton of jargon to use to help shorthand and convey a deck's goals, so would we call Muldrotha a graveyard deck or a reanimator deck? Would you call Umezawa a spell slinger deck? Those are fine descriptors, and yet they kind of miss the mark, don't they? They're a bit too broad. 
Perhaps the easiest way to describe this is with decks that are built all around a single creature type. Dinosaurs, for example. Back when Gishath was more or less the only dino commander around, perhaps simply saying a dinosaur deck was a sufficient description. But nowadays, when we have other dino options, there's a lot more going on there. For instance, there's Pantlaza, whose precon deck was called Velociraptor for a reason, the deck most commonly discovers into mana resource cards, making it easier to gradually play more and more huge dinos over time. That's quite a contrast to Gishath, a commander-centric deck that bursts a lot of creatures into play all at once. Protecting and buffing Gishath is a huge part of that strategy, often inviting you to play cards that you probably wouldn't see in Pantlaza decks. Meanwhile, Waita could be a dino deck too, only built entirely around the enrage mechanic which tends to be pretty dino-centric, and playing tons of fight spells to trigger those enrage mechanics. So all three of these could be summarized as dinosaur decks, but nowadays that descriptor is pretty insufficient if you're familiar with how different these dino decks truly are. One is gradual, one is explosive, and one's a fight deck. Or we could use a landfall as another example. Omnath, Phylath, and Rada could each be described as landfall decks, they play a lot of the same cards, and they're even in the same colors. But they play so differently even within that unifying theme. One cares not just about lands, but also elementals. Or even if you ignore that elemental synergy, it can do a lot with token multipliers, for instance. Meanwhile, Rada adds in the twist of potentially winning with commander damage, which requires a totally different support system. And Phylath isn't just landfall, but also does a bunch with plus one counters. Heck, I once put a Phyloth deck together just to try it out, and I found myself using fling effects to win games because of how big a single plant token could get. Calling any one of these just landfall decks feels incomplete. Might we say landfall elementals, or landfall fling, landfall counters, landfall Voltron. To move to a personal example, I've been asked how it is that I can have so many graveyard decks without ever getting sick of that strategy, and the answer is because of how different each of those graveyard decks manages to be. My Vohar deck is a very classic reanimator list, reviving individually powerful creatures every turn, while the Mimeoplasm is straight up trying to win with commander damage and requires a lot of setup and protection to win that way. Meanwhile, Conrad is all about filling and emptying the graveyard in any way possible, so he sometimes doesn't even care which creatures I actually have or or what I bring back into play. I expected my Baba deck to be a classic aristocrats list, but she's actually playing around with bringing multiple different card types back from the dead, and so the win conditions don't reflect aristocrats at all. And therefore, I found a more classic aristocrat strategy when I built the new Izoni, sacrificing tons of tokens for powerful death triggers. Although, heads up, I might be switching Izoni over to the new Honest Rutstein instead. And if you want to see that change or check out any of these decks, you can find a link to all of our architect pages in the description of all of our videos. But the point is, these are all graveyard decks, but the words graveyard decks are serving as an extremely big umbrella here. There are a lot of distinct caveats and nuances that make each one of these a very different flavor. To speak metaphorically, we could think of these in terms of, say, a color wheel. In the red family, you have things like crimson, rose, scarlet, maroon. They're all in the category of red, but to just describe them as red would be pretty insufficient. Those gradients matter a lot, and the same goes for commanders. I used to write an article series on EDH Rec called Commander Showdown in which I would compare two similar commanders, and this type of thing came up all the time, comparing zombie decks against each other to pick apart how they each use those zombies differently, some for death triggers, some for combo, or how two commanders that both care about legends, like Kethys and Sisse, couldn't just be called Legends Matter decks because one is a toolbox that tutors up whatever you need whenever you need it, and the other is a self-mill deck whose legends are far more difficult to permanently remove because they can just keep escaping from the graveyard. And it's not just about colors, of course. I once wrote about Halar and Verizal, both kicker decks in different colors, but to dismiss the difference between them as merely kicker in Gruul versus kicker in Simic would be a gross oversimplification. Halar is a fully fledged burn deck, they can end games very quickly, and most importantly, they don't even necessarily care what card it is you're kicking, just as long as you've loaded up a ton of counters. Whereas Verizal actually cares very much about the kicker spells you use, since you want to copy be something that will have a lot of impact. When writing this series and when comparing any two commanders, I would get a lot of questions from people who wanted to know which commander was the better one, but better was never really the point. The point is that if you wanted to, say, build a kicker deck, and you build Halar only to discover that Halar barely even cares what the kicker spells do, they just care how many counters you've got and a cheap kicker spell is just a means of triggering a potentially lethal damage effect. You could feel a little deflated, because that's potentially not what you actually wanted from building that deck. 
If you wanted a kicker deck that cares about the kicked spells, Hellar might not be the commander for you, it might be Verizal instead, even if the deck that you build with Verizal doesn't end up being as powerful, because at least it cares about the same thing you care about, and that is far more important to your satisfaction as a player. Being aware of these things can also help you understand a commander's reputation when you first sit down with it. To use another Gruul example, if you just think that Anzrag is a funny mole god, it might come as a surprise when people keep it off the board so vehemently. Because to them, it's not just a funny mole god, or even just a Gruul aggro deck, or even just an extra combat step deck. To them, it's a commander who often becomes indestructible, suits up a lure, and then wipes their whole board over and over and over again, letting them keep nothing in play. Which is a much more important gameplay feature than any of those other descriptors, like Gruul or aggro or extra combats. And that's something important to be cued in on for you, the pilot, so that you know how to navigate the heat that that commander will draw from the rest of the table so that you can play your deck more successfully. And this is why I mentioned Thunder Junction before. I wager this is a phenomenon folks may encounter with a lot of the commanders in Thunder Junction that care about committing crimes. The new Gisa, for example. She'll probably be labeled a zombie deck, but I'd hesitate to simply call her that, because the actual engine that supports her is like the Toshiro Umezawa from before. She wants a lot of removal, and that is going to shape gameplay a lot more than the mere presence of zombie cards. Or the new Marchesa. She clearly wants to play a ton of removal and a ton of counterspells, so I foresee a control shell here. Perhaps one that even uses her to dig down to find combo pieces. The new Ariette might get described as an Enchantress or an Aura deck, but it should foremost be called a Thievery deck. Hopefully that one's more obvious. There's also the new Vraska, which might get the title of being a Treasure deck, but it too would be mischaracterized by that simple term. Stella Lee might get described as Spellslinger, but she's a wicked combo and storm enabler too. And I don't mean to suggest that a single combo in a deck automatically means that it is a combo deck. Life gain decks often contain Sanguine Bond and Exquisite Blood, but we don't call them life gain combo decks, we still just call them life gain decks. One-offs do not a sub-theme make. But at a certain density, whether it's with a bunch of redundant combo pieces or a bunch of tutors to find them, that does tip the scales over, and that does majorly affect how that deck is actually going to play. That is the point where merely calling it a life gain deck would feel a little dishonest because life gain itself will barely be relevant to the actual game actions the deck will take. Now sometimes these dominant sub-themes, if we can call them that, are so obvious that it's practically comical. I wonder if when I opened this video with an example of an artifact deck that feels less like an artifact deck and more like a storm deck, you clocked that I was referring to Joyra Weatherlight Captain, a deck that's famous for playing tons of zero drop artifacts to rack up a huge storm count for things like Aetherflux Reservoir. If someone simply called that an artifact deck, you'd raise your eyebrows, wouldn't you? And again, maybe that's too obvious an example, maybe you just say, that's a storm deck, that's the primary theme, anyone calling it just an artifact deck is willfully misrepresenting it. And that's fair enough. But again, that was an obvious example, and on the flip side of that, a lot of these sub-theme problems that we as players sometimes run into are problems precisely because they're much more subtle. Back when I had a group hug deck with Kaneos and Tiro, it took me months of playing that deck to realize that group hug was not a full descriptor for that deck's actual mission. Yes, it gave benefits to other players, but the actual truth of it was that it was a control deck. I gave things out, but then I also had to keep other players in line so that they didn't go wild with all the stuff I gave them. If I was planning on winning with a reins of power to borrow someone else's lethal board, for instance, I'd often need to also have a counterspell ready to stop someone else from playing a board wipe and ruining my plan. That is control deck territory 101. Or I've got friends with Faldorn decks, and over time I've seen one of those friends evolve the way that they describe that deck, initially as an Exile Matters deck, which is obvious from the commander's abilities, and also as a Wolves deck, because it makes so many of them. Then, eventually, it also got described as an Exile Matters Tokens deck, until most recently when they've kind of been like, you know what, this is an Exile Matters Landfall deck, because I make the most wolves playing extra land drops from Exile. That took them a while to suss out, and I'm not surprised. It isn't obvious from the get-go which one will actually feel right or feel the best for you. And importantly, each time you land on and commit to one of those specific descriptors, a specific sub-theme, that affects the support system that you start to provide to that commander, which can radically change the cards you put into that deck, and how you play it, and how it plays.
This is what I'm getting at when I say it's possible a deck's sub-theme is its actual theme. On its face, a commander can be a group hug deck, or a zombie deck, or an adventure deck. But in the actual game, what's the experience your opponents will have? What do other people witness in your game actions? The group hug deck is giving stuff out, sure, but it's also removing and counterspelling all over the place. That Giza deck is making zombies, and that adventure deck plays adventures, but the things your opponents see are a whole lot of removal spells. I think being hyper aware, hyper scrutinous of a sub theme and how strong its influence can be is a hugely important part of tuning up your deck and making sure that it feels like the right strategy for you. If I like artifacts but not storm, then I know to probably veer away from Joyra as an example. And of course, players are savvy and can play around with those sub themes all the time. Just because a commander looks like it encourages one pattern of play doesn't mean it has to commit to that. Omnath, as an example, doesn't have to care about elementals to still be a banger of a commander. But for a lot of players who are building a deck and trying to figure out what's not clicking, why is it performing in a different way than I had hoped, I think this is the reason. They wanted a landfall deck, but that broad descriptor was not enough of a guiding light. Did they want a landfall tokens deck, a landfall elemental deck, landfall Voltron deck, landfall fling deck, landfall plus one counters deck? That final qualifier has a huge impact on how the deck will function, and that will impact how much they enjoy playing it. And of course, when describing our decks to other people to try and make sure that everyone's got an evenly matched game, I think these extra sub-themes are pretty important to announce, to make sure that expectations are set correctly with the entire group. I'm sympathetic to the fact that sometimes a sub-theme can be hard to pin down, like my group hug example or the Faldorn example. But also, I mean, we've all met that certain type of player who thinks that calling their list just Spellslinger is sufficient when really they're planning on storming out on turn three. And it feels a little dishonest. Or a person who's like, yeah, it's a treasure deck, and they leave out the fact that their deck contains 30 forced sacrifice spells. It's not a cute look. So if you're not trying to be an angle shooter, and I hope you're not, I think those extra descriptors will do a lot to convey what it is you really mean and help you find those evenly matched games that you're after. But even if you're not focusing on the social aspect of the game, this extra attention to sub-theme can be a huge asset to help you figure out not only which commanders click best with you, but also how to streamline your deck, how to support it, how to give it what it requires in order for it to truly flourish. Because sometimes that undercurrent in your deck is actually the real driving force, the real thing behind the wheel. Pay careful attention to the words that you use, the jargon that we use to describe the decks that we play, and pay attention also to the expectations that those words set. Are those expectations correct? And I don't just mean expectations with other people, I also mean the expectations that it forces us into when we assume that a deck must work a certain way because we've given it a specific label. By using potentially more of those labels, or shifting some of them around, that can change our lens of how we view our deck, and that can give us a lot more information and make us better players. So that's a reason why we just as players sometimes run into these issues where we play a deck and it's just not performing the way that we had hoped it would. And hopefully this framing of dominant sub-themes, which is still a very funny phrase to me, can be a better lens through which we're able to actually line up those decks with what it is that we as players are after. But also, as I said at the beginning, there's another reason that all of this happens too, something that's more on the Wizards of the Coast side of things. We'll have to get into that in another video. Keep your eye out for it, subscribe to make sure you don't miss it, comment below to let me know if you've ever struggled with this sub-theme issue, and if so, what deck was it? And as always, remember, EDH wreck your deck before you wreck your deck. Okay.